special report, The Flight of Apollo 10, brought to you by Western Electric, manufacturing and supply unit of the Bell System, as part of our continuing coverage of important news events. Reporting from the CBS News Apollo headquarters in New York, correspondent Walter Cronkite. The two Apollo 10 spacecraft have now disappeared again behind the far side of the moon. Signal was lost to Earth just a few moments ago, and this is an important pass behind the moon. Because this time, back there, where they have no communication with the Earth, Tom Stafford and Eugene Cernan in the lunar module called Snoopy will be firing their engines to bring them back on this next time around to the near side of the moon to within 10 miles of the moon's surface. The exact distance, 9.3 miles if all goes as they planned, just about 50,000 feet over the moon's surface. They should reach that point at 5.32 p.m. It's just a few miles, about 18 miles before the lunar Lunar landing site uh, number two, which is the preferred site for the landing now expected in July of Apollo 11. They, uh, uh, just a few moments after that, will be passing over the landing site at 5.36, about four minutes later. Uh, they'll be over the landing site and uh, then begin their, they will have begun their climb back out to an altitude uh, of 212 miles as they get behind the moon on that uh, revolution of the moon, their 14th. Uh, they, when they come around the next time, uh, around 7.30 p.m. that will be, uh, they will then uh, come down to within 11 miles in that same point over the moon's surface, roughly. They fire their engines and go back to rendezvous and uh, to redock with the command module at uh, 10 o'clock tonight. The actual docking coming at 11.19 p.m. So far today, they've had some very uh, high moments of this flight, uh, no pun intended, uh, as they're out there circling the moon. There have been some dramatic moments. Some of them have lasted for a couple of hours, some uh, for just a few moments. There have been some moments of concern about the flight of Apollo 10 today. The first uh, uh, little hitch came right after Eugene Cernan and then Tom Stafford climbed into the lunar module this morning after they uh, awakened uh, uh, after a good night's sleep. They got down there and found that their communications back with John Young left alone in the command module weren't too good nor with the ground. They finally got those straightened away and communications have been uh, nearly perfect ever since. And then at one o'clock this afternoon as they were pressurizing the uh, various parts of the spacecraft they found that the three-foot tunnel that joins the two spacecraft, they could not uh, vent the uh, pressure from it, and that gave them a major cause for concern. They finally decided that uh, they could go ahead with the mission without venting the pressure completely there, getting it down to, oh, just about uh, uh, two-thirds of what it should be, which would be zero. Instead of five pounds per square inch, they got it down to three and a half pounds per square inch. Uh, but then a new problem developed. And because they could not uh, depressurize uh, that area, uh, additional friction was set up in their docking uh, configuration and their rings and there was some fear that they might, might cause damage to those uh, rings which have to work when they come back and redock if they are to successfully redock and get back between the two uh, modules. Well, uh, they were behind the moon by the time the final test had to come. The uh, strain did not become as great as the uh, ground feared in Houston control. They'd given them some constraints that if it got to, to a certain point, uh, they could not go on with the mission. It did not get to that point. They separated as planned and uh, now they are separated. They made the pass around the moon in their separated configuration uh, with the lunar module, Snoopy, just about 35, 40 feet out from the command module, Charlie Brown. Uh, they then separated even further and now have disappeared to the far side of the moon for this next important maneuver, uh, which uh, is scheduled to come uh, at precisely, let me give you the moment, 4.35 p.m. That's when Stafford and Cernan in the uh, in uh, the uh, lunar module, fire their descent propulsion system engine. That's an engine that is throttleable. It can be throttled from a thousand to nine thousand uh, uh, pounds of thrust. They fire that for the first time, giving it its first major test. Uh, they break, in effect, as the far side of the moon, so that they slow down and drop toward the moon. 
down to that uh, 10 mile altitude. The next maneuver at 435, and then uh, down, swooping down to the moon's surface uh, at uh, 532 p.m. Nelson Benton and Scott McLeod at Grumman Aircraft in Bethpage, Long Island, can tell us what's going on in that uh, lunar module right now. Well, are we sort of looking forward to one of the things that will be going on after that descent orbit insertion? When the limb goes down and gets down to that 50,000 feet, 50,000 foot point, one of the tests that has to be made is the limb's altimeter. Anytime you are going to make a control landing on a surface, it's a good idea to know how high you are. Since normal altimeters are actuated by barometric pressure, and since there is no atmosphere on the moon, LEM-4 is carrying a small pod about the size of a double loaf bread box right under the descent stage of the vehicle. It is a radar pod that looks around at the lunar surface. This does the looking, and it feeds what it sees into the cockpit. And Scott McLeod, what, how do you read what the radar is showing? Well, Nelson, up here in the cockpit, what we have is an altitude, an altitude rate on these two indicators, and also we have our forward and lateral velocity on this cross pointer. Primarily, we will get our best indications of those readings on the next flight, that's Apollo 11. This flight, Apollo 10, we will evaluate the radar, but really the proof of the pudding is the following flight. Walter, uh, the radar works uh, much better. It actually uh, sees very well down at about 18,000 feet, but it's, it's a bit, it will work this time a bit like uh, flying an aircraft over Pittsburgh and the Washington Control Center can't see you very well, but it may just get some indication that, that you are there, and that's uh, the kind of test we're having this time. They did have some difficulty a little earlier, too. One of those uh, high points of drama that we mentioned uh, that but we failed to itemize was that after the, they settled the depressurization and the friction on the docking ring problem, uh, then after they had separated and were checking out the radar, they suddenly found that part of the radar, not that landing radar, but the radar used to uh, rejoin uh, the command module later on tonight uh, was, did not seem to be working turned out that a, a power switch needed to be thrown that apparently had not been, or at any rate, they got it straightened out, but uh, it gave them two or three very bad minutes. One of the problems in this flight, of course, is the fact that uh, every uh, orbit of the moon for 45 minutes out of the two-hour time for that revolution, they disappear behind the far side of the moon, and uh, the ground control wants everything working properly uh, to uh, give them a go for those vital maneuvers, all of which take place behind the moon. Uh, since uh, that's the case, uh, they have just an hour and 15 minutes to settle any problems they've got while they've still got uh, con uh, contact with the ground, or else uh, the ground would not give them a go for each of these stages of the flight. CBS News color coverage, the flight of Apollo 10, will continue in a moment. And so with Charlie Brown sitting there all alone, about five miles higher and three miles behind uh, Snoopy. Uh, Snoopy in uh, another, uh, oh, be 40 minutes from now, a little more than that, will be firing as uh, he has fired his engines, but at that time will be sweeping around on this side of the moon and uh, making that low pass of the landing site. The Charlie Brown is keeping a watchful eye over Snoopy and is prepared to go to Snoopy's help if uh, needs it in these delicate maneuvers. In coming down to that 10 mile height, uh, Tom Stafford uh, said it yesterday, it's going to take some pretty uh, sharp piloting to get into that 10 mile height, uh, traveling at uh, 3,700 miles per hour uh, over the moon surface with the jagged peaks and the uncertain of those mass cons. The United States and the Soviet Union have been sending unmanned spacecraft uh, to the moon since 1959. And scientists have been studying the data that they returned. Well, last December, of course, Apollo 8 brought us the first look at the moon as seen by man with his own eyes. And now just two months from now, if all goes well, the first man will set foot on the moon. But even with all the information scientists have collected, Many questions remain unanswered. And David Schumacher reports. Right, uh, a little bit to your right. A little more, a little more. Right okay, right there. Down to 20% of the bottom. I don't know if we see it. We'll see that. A little more. Okay, let's see how it works. 
Scientists have tried almost everything they could think of to learn about the moon without actually being there. For centuries, the moon has been studied, studied through telescopes, studied by radio. It has been probed, scratched, and photographed. Rockets without men have slammed into her skin like guided missiles. Rockets with men have skimmed as close as 60 miles. For all that, the moon remains a mystery. And Eugene Cernan, one of the crew on this flight of Apollo 10, reflects man's enthusiasm about going there. I think the... I think everything about the moon is unknown. Uh, we, all, our, all our history about the moon, about its origin, uh, is theoretical. Uh, you know, why do we only see one face of the moon? Uh, we can project uh, scientific reasons for this, but uh, what is the moon's surface made out of? Uh, is there any active, is it a dead body? Is there any, any active uh, volcanic uh, activity going on today? Is it really colorless? You know, it's, it's in, almost inconceivable that a, a mass that big could be sort of a drab, colorless body. Uh, I think it's just a first step in finding out a little bit about the origin of uh, our whole existence. There are other questions, too, some basic questions just about getting to the moon. Although unmanned surveyor spacecraft have soft landed on the moon and taken enough pictures to provide an accurate mosaic of her surface, it is only recently that scientists have become aware of what they call mass con. First discovered on other unmanned flights, those of lunar orbiter, the effects of mascons became better understood after the Christmas time flight of astronauts Borman, Lovell, and Anders in Apollo 8. The word mascon is a shortening of two words, mass concentrations. All we know for sure is that they are points on the moon where the attraction of gravity is greater. As a result, as spacecraft pass over mascons, they drop closer to the moon and go faster. As they leave their influence, spacecraft tend to climb and go slower. Needless to say, astronauts who fly close to the moon are concerned about mass cons, particularly their effect on a spacecraft about to make a landing. Trajectory experts hope to learn more about mass cons from this flight of Apollo 10. And scientists are interested too, as Harold Mazursky of the U.S. Geological Survey explained. Well, they're just as fascinating to us and as important to us as they are to the trajectory people because this says that the moon is not homogeneous. That is, it is varied from place to place. And that tells us some very fundamental things. That is, that there, are probably chemi there is probably chemical differentiation on the moon, so that there are large variations in the chemistry and the gravity from place to place. This also says that probably there are circulation patterns on the moon like there are on the Earth. And what this really gives us is the fact that there will be ways that the moon is much more like the Earth than we thought it was originally. And we can hopefully, by studying it, learn more about the Earth, too. Learning about the Earth by studying the moon will be quite a reversal. Until now, geologists have been forced to base their conclusions about the moon mostly on studies of the Earth. It's been the only way, for instance, to train these amateur geologists who are trying to become professionals as quickly as possible. But they are Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin, assigned to Apollo 11. This summer, they're scheduled to be the first men to actually set foot on the moon. It is only after they return that scientists will be able to abandon moon simulations such as this one on Earth. The proper study of the moon will finally be the moon. However, even that probably won't match the excitement of simply knowing we landed on the moon. We did it, and we can do more. David Schumacher, CBS News, Flagstaff, Arizona. And so the Apollo 10, the two spacecraft, are now behind the moon. The descent orbit insertion has been made. It was made 10 minutes ago when the descent propulsion system engine was fired behind the moon, as far as we know. We have not had that confirmation because they are behind the moon, no communication with the Earth. But assuming that all is going well, they have fired that uh, descent propulsion system engine for some 27 and 7 tenths second to slow them down by just 48 and a half miles per hour, but enough to drop them out of their uh, orbit into a lower peri perigee, the low point of the orbit when they come around the moon the other time. The next time, we can show you approximately how this all happens. As they come around the moon, this time they would incidentally uh, be just a little bit uh, from uh, the command module at that point, which you see coming around the moon. They come around in this fashion, and then coming down slower and slower, they come down to this point just 10 miles above the moon's surface. 
Then they begin to come out again. They fire their engines so that this time they will go into a very high orbit out here and eventually will be uh, 350 miles away from the command module. They'll get out to their high point on the far side of the moon again, come sweeping down below the, uh, uh, down to the low point again as they come around this next time and again 11 miles above the moon's surface. This time they fire to go back and rejoin the command module and that rendezvous takes place on the far side of the moon also. All of the principal uh, uh, maneuvers of this uh, uh, dramatic part of the flight of Apollo 10 occur behind the moon except for that dropping down to the moon's surface. The lunar module as firings take place on this near side of the moon but uh, the uh, rendezvous maneuvers and the uh, others take place on the far side of the moon. Bruce Morton at the Manned Spacecraft Center in Houston has a report now on what the flight controllers mission control are most anxious to learn about the moon in preparation for the flight of Apollo 11, the moon landing flight, and what they noticed most in uh, yesterday's uh, television pictures of the moon. Bruce? Well, uh, they're doing one thing differently this time. Uh, David Schumacher was talking about mass guns uh, just a minute ago, as we all have been off and on. Uh, the theory here now seems to be that uh, while the mass cons can, uh, can be a hazard to a pilot in that they will uh, suddenly speed him up or slow him down, that uh, over a whole revolution, those effects tend to even out. And uh, one of the problems they had on H, you'll remember, was a difficulty uh, in predicting where the spacecraft would be two revolutions from where it was, and that's the kind of prediction you have to make in order to achieve a rendezvous. The theory now is that the error in those predictions, which ran to five or six miles down track and perhaps a mile or so in height uh, during the Apollo 8 flight, that those, uh, those mistakes were really caused by the shape of the moon, which, uh, as you know, Walter, is not round but pear-shaped with a substantial bulge sticking out towards the Earth, the result of the Earth's gravitational pull. So what they've done uh, between the Apollo 8 flight and now is to make a new model of the moon's gravitational field based on data from the lunar orbiter flights and also from the Apollo 8 flight to feed that new model into the big computer here. And that way they hope to get much better data to feed up to uh, Charlie Brown and Snoopy when they're telling them how long they need to burn and what the inclination should be and so forth. They expect that this new model will reduce the kind of error they had on eight to uh, perhaps a half a mile or less in length and just a few hundred feet in height, hopefully the, the kind of distance that these pilots can correct. We did talk yesterday with Jack Smith, the astronaut geologist who uh, has been studying the lunar surface, who watched the uh, television transmission yesterday and was taking extensive notes on what the astronauts said about the moon. He was impressed with the accuracy and the detail of their observations. He wasn't really surprised by anything. He said he noticed uh, that they talked about volcanoes a good deal. That's an argument for those who think the moon has a volcanic history, but uh, most geologists do anyway. He also noted that the astronauts saw the rills, those uh, sort of creek beds on the moon, as having sharp outlines with no spillover. That's an argument for those who think uh, they may have been made by water sometime in the past. But all in all, it, uh, it adds up on this flight so far to a little more detail and no surprises. A report from Bruce Morton at the Manned Space Center in Houston, Texas, where this flight is being controlled, of course. And those controllers on the ground deserve a great deal of the credit, of course, for this flight. Uh, the whether the pilots could possibly do this alone or not uh, is never a question that's been raised because of the considerable support from the manned space center. They are getting telemetry except for this dark side pass around the moon. They're getting telemetry for an hour and 15 minutes out of every two hour revolution of the moon. A full report on every function of every uh, component of both the command module and the lunar module. And they are actually flying the mission there as well as the men in the uh, spacecraft. But when, John, when Tom Stafford and Eugene Cernan get down there to that point uh, right uh, close to the moon, 9.6 miles was the determination of the Manned Space Center just a little while ago in figuring their orbits. Uh, and they'll get another figure on that as they come sweeping around to, the, uh, to our side of the moon uh, very shortly. Uh, they will, uh, uh, they, they then, uh, Stafford and Cernan, will be eyeballing as well as using their radar to get right down there to that 50,000 foot high level. CBS News color coverage of the flight of Apollo 10 will continue in a moment.
Charles Schultz, the great cartoonist figure, Charlie Brown, it always seems to be alone. He's a lonely figure in that great uh, comic strip. And so is Charlie Brown, the command module right now, with John Young as its pilot, alone, with his uh, two compatriots on the flight of Apollo 10, now out there some distance from him in the lunar module. And I was wondering, Bill Stout and Leo Krupp out at North American uh, Rockwell in Downey, California, just what John Young's doing alone in the command module right now. Well, he may be alone, Walter, but he's certainly busier than ever, I, I would guess, at this point. Leo, how tough is it for one man to fly this ship after the other two have gone off on their own, in effect? Well, Bill, uh, John is flying the vehicle on automatic pilot, but he is quite busy. He's spending most of his time floating between the left couch here where I'm in right now and down to the lower equipment bay because John is tracking the lunar module throughout this entire maneuver. He'll be using the sextant, which is a 28-power instrument, to uh, track the, the lunar module, and the lunar module has a blinking light on it. So he'll sight through that instrument, see the blinking light. If the blinking light is not in the center of the reticle at the time, he will take a hand controller down there and fly the optics to center the blinking light exactly in the center of the reticle of the sextant. When it's centered, then he presses a mark button, which sends that information to the computer. The computer accepts this information, and based on this, plus the VHF ranging, which John has up here on a, on a display in front of him, which is, is also it, sent into the... Uh, explain VHF ranging to me. How, how is it used in this flight? Well, this VHF ranging, the command module sends a VHF radio signal to the lunar module. It's taken into the lunar module, turned around, and sent back to us, and we measure the time elapsed for the signal to go from the command module to the lunar module and back, and we convert that into distance. So at all times, uh, John Young will be reading out here the distance the lunar module is from him. For example, right now, the lunar module is 84.93 miles away on this instrument. The, uh, one of the interesting parts about John's task on this particular uh, LEM rendezvous is the fact that our maximum separation is going to be about 365 miles. Now, on Apollo 9, the maximum separation was about 98 miles. Uh, we're going to be right out near the limits of, of our optical tracking. Our data shows that we'll be able to see the blinking light out to 400 miles, so we're getting pretty close to the limit of, of visual tracking. But he isn't just watching it to uh, see what his friends are doing. There's a specific purpose, isn't there, in feeding all this back into the computer? Isn't he ready at any time to go after them if they need help? That's right, Bill. All this marking that he's doing, both with the optics and the VHF, is fed into our computer which is computing a solution for the next lunar module maneuver. Now, if anything should happen in the lunar module or they cannot perform their maneuver, John Young will be prepared within probably a minute or a minute and a half to do the mirror image or the opposite type of burn to maintain the relative motion between the two vehicles that would have occurred if the LEM had been able to perform its maneuver. Certainly, you people at North American Rockwell didn't build Apollo with a trip close to the moon's surface in mind, and yet it has that capability. Well, Bill, there's no atmosphere on the moon, so theoretically you could orbit the moon down to the altitude of the highest mountain peak. Uh, there's no uh, aerodynamic problems or heating problems like we have around Earth, so your orbit could be very low around the moon as long as you didn't impact one of the peaks. Mm -hmm. And Apollo could go down how low if it had to, to pull LEM out of trouble? Well, depending on where the LEM have its, has its problem, which uh, could be as low as 50,000 feet, we could affect a, a rescue at 50,000 feet. Would it be risky? I mean, it's not built into the flight plan or, or the program of things expectable. Would well, it, be? it is built into the flight plan, and uh, the crews have practiced uh, rendezvous both with the LEM active and with the command module active, so I'm sure John Young is very proficient in this maneuver, and if anything should happen, uh, I feel very confident that he will be able to perform the maneuvers properly. In effect, Big Brother pulling the little ones out of it. Yes. If it has to be done that way. Walter? That's everything, of course. Uh, Leo and Bill right up to a, uh, a force landing or a crash landing of the lunar module on the surface. If that happened, uh, there would be no rescue capability uh, for these uh, two pilots of the lunar module. Uh, speaking of uh, John Young, as the moon landing mission comes closer, of course, uh, most of the emphasis has been on the lunar module, the landing craft and its occupants, not on the command module pilot. But recently, Dave Schumacher asked John Young if he would prefer being in the lunar module. Actually, part of our work is to look out. Uh, you know, oddly enough, uh, 
the most important, exciting, if you want, of course, there's a lot of exciting periods in this flight, but uh, some of the most critical periods are those periods which there is the most to do. And this particular pass, the low pass over the landing site, is uh, one of those, those periods. Uh, one of our objectives, though, is, is uh, to, well, the first objective as we come across is a landing radar test. So we have to be in particular attitudes. Now, Tom is flying the spacecraft to give you an idea of this coordination. He's flying the spacecraft and I'm running some computers during this period of time. We're also taking pictures of the first two available landing sites for the first lunar landing. And these pictures are very valuable and very important because never have we really seen an approach to the second one. And it's always nice to have seen where you're going before you go there. So we're taking those pictures. We're looking out. And you're right. It's going to be hard to concentrate. I'd like to know what my words are going to be. I only hope that they're adequate to describe what we see and what we feel uh, to those people who are listening. Well, that wasn't the interview by uh, Shoemaker that we expected. He was talking there to Eugene Cernan about the uh, landing site and the sighting of the uh, landing site. Uh, Cernan, not uh, Young. We talked about uh, what uh, is going on with John Young in the command module right now. Leo Krupp told us what he is doing. Let's uh, go out to Grumman Aircraft in Bethpage, Long Island, where they build the lunar module, and where Nelson Benton is with Scott McLeod, their test uh, astronaut. Uh, what are they doing now in the lunar module, gentlemen? Well, Walter, we figure uh, the lunar module right now is uh, something a little over a half hour from that uh, first pass over the 50,000 foot point. And Scott, uh, is it very busy uh, in LAM-4 right now? Well, yes. As Gene had just mentioned, they are going to use the landing radar and take some photographs. And, of course, they're setting up for this. But in the meantime, as they're making their descent, they're checking the rendezvous radar and coming from the command module. They're checking the range and range rate on these instruments to determine how fast they're going down toward the moon and how far away they are from the command module. We might point out that uh, we read uh, rendezvous radar and uh, landing radar on the same uh, instruments. It's just uh, flicking a switch. To yes, see we which can one select you. either one on that same instrument. The site that, uh, that uh, LAM-4 is approaching to a, a look at point right now is uh, landing point, landing site two, and this is uh, on the edge of the Sea of Tranquility. Is there anything magic about the Sea of Tranquility as a landing spot? Is it a nice place to visit, or are there other criteria, Scott? Well, yes, it's a nice place to visit in that it's a nice, smooth landing spot, and that certainly is one of the criteria. Uh, one of the other ones is that the sun angle must be right, and therefore, because of the day you launch, the sun is in a certain position with respect to the moon, and that, give it, that gives us, as we make a landing on the moon, a sun angle over our shoulder of about 10 degrees. And we want a good approach toward it and a good it's ascent like a away. pass, you approach out of the sun. Well, that's not the reason. It's for visibility. Because if the sun was in front of you, obviously, you'd uh, have it right in your eyes and wouldn't be able to see. If it was directly overhead, then you would have no shadows, no good definition of the surface. I presume, too, there are some criteria attached to this landing site that are concerned with, with liftoff when the time comes to, uh, to leave them. Well, you want a good definition of your ascent path. So there would be something you recognize, like craters or mountains, as you are making an ascent also. And you would want to clear them, but you would want to be able to identify the path. And so, Walter, uh, Tom Stafford and Gene Cernan are going down for that first reconnaissance of the spot that's been picked for the main event this summer. Scott, uh, a great deal has been said about uh, pilot skill in this uh, very delicate operation that we're about to come up on. And incidentally, they acquire the signal in just 11 minutes from now as they come around uh, on the uh, near side of the moon again. Uh, uh, how much pilot skill, in the sense that they have injected themselves now uh, into an orbit that brings them into this low perigee, just 10 miles above the moon's surface, what can they do about it if those instruments read out that they're not precisely on that course? Well, Walter, I guess the pilot skill that we're involved in right now is evaluating all of the data that comes into them as pilots and then making the correct decisions and basing these decisions on their background experience as pilots and their training in the astronaut program. 
Can they do anything to alter that course down toward perigee uh, uh, in the spacecraft uh, at this point? Yes, they can. If everything goes wrong and they must go completely to manual, then they can go back up manually. Uh, if small things deteriorate, then they can take over or select a new program through the computer and abort their mission at any point. In other words, they, uh, instead of continuing the descent, would begin an ascent again. Yes. Right. Now, one other thing you mentioned there, uh, the sun angle. You know this uh, entire flight of Apollo uh, 10, as we have pointed out before, is on the exact timeline, that is, on the same schedule precisely as the Apollo 11 mission, if it uh, continues to be planned as it is now, and probably would be. Uh, however, this flight is running 12 minutes behind its original schedule. That's because they did not make uh, all of the mid-course corrections that were needed, and uh, they arrived at the moon 12 minutes early, or uh, 12 minutes late. So this uh, 12 minutes will make a slight difference in the sun angle on the landing site as to that preferred for Apollo 11. However, the degree of the sun's difference in that 12 minutes is so small, so teeny, that uh, it really will not make a critical difference in what they see from Apollo 10 and what will be seen from Apollo 11. Let's now try to pick up uh, John Young's comments on whether he'd prefer to be in the lunar module. Well, uh, at this point in time, I, I don't think I would. I've got a fascinating job in the command module. I get to do a lot of things, and uh, I'm pretty well wrapped up in it. It's a uh, it's a fascinating job uh, running a spacecraft all by yourself. Uh, keeps you busy. The tasks that I've got to do in there are, are varied. There's no two alike. I'm doing something different every minute, and uh, I think I wouldn't trade places right now with anybody. You just stay in a couch, or do you move around a lot to keep track of them? No, flying a three-man spacecraft when you're by yourself is uh, keeps you moving around. You have to check the systems. You have to check the guidance. Uh, performance. You have to to operate the computer, the autopilot, and the controls if you have to do uh, thrusting maneuvers, turn the engines on and off, and so that keeps you in all. Uh, that keeps you in three different places in the spacecraft at the same time, almost. A lot easier in zero gravity than in uh, simulations. And with seven and a half minutes before signal should be acquired again as they come back on this side of the moon, CBS News color coverage. The flight of Apollo 10 will continue in a moment. If you like this video, please press the subscribe button to subscribe to this channel and also give it a thumbs up. You can also be notified when I post further videos on the anniversary of this flight and on the anniversary of the flight of Apollo 11 coming up in July. You can also support this channel with a donation by using the link in the description.